you know, um, the prison doesn't look much different than the elementary school and the high schools that I went to. There's bars on the windows, locks on the doors, you know, metal detectors you have to go through. Um, even on your way to school, oftentimes you might have a police officer or two who might stop you and harass you. Um, these things are sent are, are pretty much in place to also uh, dehumanize you and anger you. So by the time you get to prison after going through all these things on the street, you're already angry. You're already fed up with the system. And then when you get inside and you realize the system that they say they're supposed to be re rehabilitating you, they do nothing for you. And so now you're even angry and most people might come out either broken and or uh, angry, you know, and, and rebellious even more so. So uh, you talk about it being privatized and it being about money. Myself alone, I did 20 years and four months in prison at $55,000 a year in the state of New Jersey, that's $1.1 million that was made off of me in the state of, uh, you know, through my incarceration. And I'm just one person that was incarcerated in New Jersey. And so that's taxpayers' money, you know, so the system is designed. Why would they want to rehabilitate if it's to make money? That means that officers are gonna, they're not gonna be able to uh, continue paying the salaries of many officers. Judges may lose their jobs, uh, prosecutors, if there's not a bunch of people coming through the system, police officers. And so the system works exactly as it's supposed to work. And that's not counting the $1.1 million that the taxpayers uh, funnel through the system to keep me incarcerated. It doesn't even count the tens of thousands of dollars that myself and others like me had to pay through my incarceration for things like food and cosmetics, uh, having conversations with my family members and the likes. So the system works. Hello and welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director, and today we're pleased to welcome back one of the Forum's long-standing guests, Chris Hedges, to talk about his latest book, Our Class, Trauma and Transformation in an American Prison. Since 2013, Hedges, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, has been teaching courses in drama, literature, philosophy, and history in the college degree program offered by Rutgers University to inmates in the New Jersey prison system. His latest book is a hauntingly powerful account of the voices trapped within a cruel penal system that too often defines their lives. After studying August Wilson's work and others, Hedges class at East Jersey State Prison decided to write their own play, Caged, which played to sold out audiences at the Passage Theatre in Trenton, New Jersey, and went on to be published. In our class, Hedges chronicles the class's grief and suffering, as well as their personal transformations. They're crafted in detail, giving voice to those who our society often demonizes and abandons. Stefan Whitley, a former student and graduate of the Rutgers program, joins our discussion today. He was incarcerated in multiple New Jersey prisons and is now engaged in criminal justice reform work. So welcome to you both, Chris. Welcome, Stefan. Thank you. So first, let's start with you, Chris. You're already a very seasoned war correspondent when you started teaching in prison. And you say that being able to read others quickly was a great skill that you were able to use navigating your way around. But you also admit that there was quite a lot to learn. Um, would you mind reading an excerpt um, from the book um, about your first three classes? My first three classes did not go well. The students were wary and distant. They were nearly always silent when I asked questions about the new Jim Crow. I often waited uncomfortably until finally answering my own question. If someone did volunteer an answer, it was terse and neutral. Nothing that I or any informant or snitch assigned to monitor the class could report back to prison authorities. They watched carefully to assess who I was and what I was about. There is a natural and understandable mistrust of do-gooders, those who come into a prison to burnish their own credentials as social progressives, who seek an unattainable bond of solidarity with the incarcerated and revel in the exoticism of prison like visiting wild animals in a zoo. I knew the protocol by then, I didn't pretend to be hip. My collection of button-down shirts, round Harry Potter glasses, and Brooks Brothers suits precluded that. I did not pretend I knew who they were. 
or what their lives were like, despite experiences in war zones that overlap their own. I did not ask a student why he was incarcerated. I had learned that important prohibition from my, my neighbor Celia, who first approached me to teach in a prison. Indeed, I rarely looked up their sentences, which I could do on the Department of Corrections search engines. I knew their crime, if they committed a crime, was used by the penal system and the wider society to freeze them in time as a criminal, even decades later. And they were acutely aware of this branding. And when you peeled back their defensive layers, you would find this wound. Wow, so powerful. Um, so how did you go about building trust with the um, inmates? And how did you get them involved in the process of wanting to share information with you? Um, I'll give my version, then I'll, I'll let Steph uh, speak to that. Uh, Steph, when I talk about wary and distant, that describes Steph in those first few classes, um, understandably. Uh, I mean, I would say <clears throat> part of what I just read that I didn't pretend that I uh, understood where they came from. I, you know, I was real about who I was and where I came from. If anything, I kind of accentuated the nerd aspect a little more uh, than, uh, you know, was perhaps given my history uh, 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 accurate. Um, uh, but I, uh, you know, I think that you build relationships uh, by uh, showing that you care. Uh, and, and I think that was part of it and that, you know, my own kind of uh, attempt to be honest and upfront about who I was and all that. But then also that process of when they were writing scenes ripped down the emotional walls, protective walls that they build, must build in the prison to protect themselves. And so that changed the atmosphere in the class, uh, because it, it, it inadvertently, it wasn't premeditated, required people to be vulnerable. I mean, we had, these are tough guys. You don't cry in a prison. We had people choking back tears and got very emotional. They were speaking about trauma and grief and loss and experiences uh, that people around them that they had known for decades uh, had never heard. I mean, uh, I'm gonna let Steph talk to this in a minute, but we had one guy, Lawrence Bell, he uh, was arrested at the age of 14. His father had died when he was two. Uh, his mother died when he was nine. He was living as an orphan in an abandoned house in Camden, New Jersey, which per capita is the poorest city in America and usually the most violent and most dangerous in terms of per capita homicides. He's 90 pounds. He's a child. He's barely literate. He's dragged into a Camden City police station and forced to sign a, a confession that he can not that he can uh, doesn't even understand he gets to court and remember it's a child being tried as an adult he has no legal protection no family nobody's watching out for him he hears the charges that are read against him from the confession attempts to dispute them to say that they're untrue is slapped down and uh was given a sentence uh, that did not allow him to go before a parole board, which doesn't mean he's going to be out. It means he was not even allowed to request release until he was 70 years old. And what he had, what Steph had, what so many people in that classroom had, was this remarkable ability to, to take these circumstances, uh, which would crush most of us, uh, and just decide to become the best people they could become. So Lawrence, like Steph, was a stellar student. Uh, usually always an A, again like Steph, and I remember teaching a history class with him and he waited till everyone left the room and he said, I know I'm going to die in this prison, but I work as hard as I do because one day I'm going to be a teacher like you. And he walks out. And people ask me about hope. Well, that doesn't change the, the monolithic horror of mass incarceration or what we have done to the poor, but I can live on that for a very long time. And just as a caveat, a very courageous, wonderful public attorney, Jennifer Stiletti, spent two years getting him a resentencing hearing. Um, I got to tell this story for Steph before I let him talk. So uh, getting him a resentencing hearing, and he doesn't have any family. He doesn't have any family, and they won't release, even if he was approved for release, for time served, they wouldn't release him until he had an address where he could go, and he had no address. So my garage was filled with uh, stuff for an apartment donated by former classmates of his who had gotten out. We raised money. We got him an apartment. He got an address. 
And at that resensing hearing, which I testified at, uh, I wore my clerical collar. I very rarely uh, wear it. I wore it to visit to, so I could get in the halfway house and visit Steph when he was in the halfway house. Steph's Muslim. Lawrence is Muslim. And uh, uh, so at the end of the day, they don't tell you, you know, and they're all shackled. It's just awful. At the end of the day, um, I wait all day long. And in the, the day, it's just me sitting there. So the sheriff's deputy realizes that I'm there for Lawrence. And he, uh, the door opens. He turns to Lawrence and said, who's that effing minister? And Lawrence said, that's my pastor. That was a very kind of, uh, you know, proud. I'm not trying to, I speak Arabic. I spent seven years in the Middle East. I have a profound respect for Islam. I'm trying to bring anyone to Jesus. But uh, that was a really profound moment for me. Um, and I'm going to let Steph, because he was in the class, he can tell, tell what it was like from the other side. <laughs> yeah, um, for me, um, I, be I believe Chris, he used in his own words as a war correspondent, he had to learn how to read people. And um, if you're a person who's going to be able to survive in a prison in a good way, um, you need to learn how to read people. And so, you know, we developed those skills from an early age, from the streets and through the prison system. So... For me, and I, I, I would think a lot of other guys, we were able to read who Chris was, just like a lot of other professors. Um, and, you know, you actually just, after a while, you still have your guard up because you have to make sure. But he just, you know, came off as a very genuine person. As we got to know him more, we realized that that was the case. Um, and he, he didn't try too hard to be uh, a teacher. Instead, he was an individual who was coming in to share right, to share his knowledge, uh, to converse with us and um, actually learn from us as well. You know, so even before we started writing a play, we went over um, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. And so to hear him, how critical he was of the system when he, we, when we, you know, went back and forth in dialogue about the book, those type of things opened the doors and, and, and at the same time, tore down some walls that we had up of, you know, distrust. Because, of course, when he first came in, it's who is this white guy, right? Um, you know, what is his motive? But um, turned out to be an amazing um, individual, not just a professor. So um, let's go back to this program, which um, I imagine for someone serving 20 years, Stefan, must have been some sort of light at the end of the tunnel. But before we get to the light at the end of the tunnel, um, while you're in the prison uh, in East Jersey, you get sentenced to solitary confinement, and they've got an, a nice euphemism for solitary confinement, administrative segregation, which um, I think it's now changed again. But uh, anyway, that was what it was called. And in 2009, you get sent to solitary confinement for 365 days, which I found incredible, uh, for being in possession of a contraband cell phone that you were sold from uh, a prison guard for $200. So can you tell me a little bit about the conditions in that? Because I think many people would be surprised that this isn't some torture unit in the third world that we're talking about. Um, and this is what you had to put up with before you were in this nice redemption program that Chris was unable, were allowed to get you to get into. So if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about the conditions. Yeah, um, so I'll tell you about the conditions, but I was told about the conditions, you know, I've heard stories about it for years while I was incarcerated, but nothing prepared me for what it actually was. Um, so when they took me to the unit and told me this is my cell and opened the, the uh, gates, um, you could just hear the noise as soon as you walked on the tier, guys just screaming, maybe let's say 10 guys from different areas just nonstop yelling just to have conversation with one another because they were isolated. Um, and then when I walked inside the cell, it was just so small and everything was metal. Like all the walls were metal. The ceiling was metal. Um, the bed was metal. The, the, uh, the, the toiletry was metal. The only thing that wasn't was the floor and it was concrete. Um, the walls were so small that, you know, I could just reach my arms out and touch, you know, both walls. If I put my hands up high enough, I could touch the ceiling. Uh, and when it was hot, the walls would sweat. You know, men have died in there from extreme heat, exhaustion. Uh, so it was just, it was like, it was, it was very, it was very degradating. To me, the, the most degradate um, part about it all was the toilet situation. So you look, there's four walls, all metal. 
And then there's a hole in the, one of the walls and that's in the back of the cell. And so I've been told about it for whatever reason, I guess I forgot. I just couldn't imagine it being that way. But there was an indention in a wall that was, you know, cut in metal. And basically you sit in it and you sit on a slab of metal um, and there's a hole in there, you know, and that's where you, you use the bathroom and you defecate, you urinate. But there's no way to flush it. So I'm looking around like, well, where do you push the button to flush the toilet? Because I can smell it from whoever was there before. Um, and you don't. You don't flush it. Whatever touches the wall, the, the metal parts on the side of the toilet pretty much stays there until they allow you to clean it once a week. So if you urinate or defecate and whatever touches those sides of that metal wall, you're going to smell it for that entire week. And as it gets hot, as it gets hotter, um, it can be very uh, it can sickening. You know, unfortunately, what I've learned is you get used to it after a while. Um, and so to me, that was just the most um, degrading thing in my incarceration. And then you had so many mice there that the mice actually would just be playing games. They were playing tag, just running around. Um, and you have to worry about them coming to your cell at night, which they absolutely did. You know, mice climbing on people, people losing their minds. Some people in there playing with mice, um, making them their pets. Uh, and a lot of the individuals really actually lost their minds, started harming themselves, even some killed themselves. And you ask like, why? Like, why would individuals actually harm themselves? There was no form of... Uh, social work that was adequate to try to address the issues of, you know, how individuals were feeling. Instead, the guards would basically come down the tier and you can hear anything in every cell because there was just bars on the wall um, as a door. And so if I can, if you're three cells down, I can hear anything you say to the individual. So they would, the uh, social worker would come once every two weeks and he would just stop at every cell as if he was giving out, you know, gum or something and say, hey, is everything okay in there? Um, do you feel like killing yourself? Do you have a hard time sleeping at night? And as Chris talked about in prison, there's certain things you don't supposed to do in prison and one of them is be weak. So no one is gonna say, yes, I'm having a hard time. I need to talk to someone, right? Um, I need help. I can't deal with this. And so everyone is saying, yeah, get away from my cell. Ain't nothing wrong with me, get out of here. But guys are absolutely losing their minds. And so, um, yeah, so the, the terminology they use, admitted segregation is just a slap in the face, you know, for that situation. Can, can I just, Steph, can you explain, because you're the numbers of hours you're locked in, and then also, uh, I remember you telling me the heat got get into the 90s. Uh, let, address those two issues, because you're, you're never let out, and then the conditions inside the cell are, it's as if you're in a sauna or a furnace. Right. So they, they basically call it 23 and one, meaning that you're locked in for 23 hours and you're let out for an hour. But in actuality, mathematically that's the case, but it's not. Um, so they usually will let you go out to the yard every other day and you'll go out to the yard, which is supposed to be two, that two hours, but it's actually about an hour and a half. And so that's your two hours. Um, that's, that's your hour every day, 23 and one. So one day you'll actually be locked in for about uh, 23 hours and, 50 minutes, that other 10 minutes, they allow you to go take a shower. And part of that 10 minutes is you walking to and from the shower. Um, and so as far as the heat, uh, yeah. So basically, however it is, however hot it is outside in the summertime, it probably feels like 125% of that. So like, again, like I said, walls literally sweating. Um, in the summertime, it got so hot that I used to basically just sleep in my underwear and my boxes, or just not even sleep, just lay in my underwear. Um, this, the mattress and the sheets are just soaked from soaked, you know, from sweat. And they would sell us ice instead of give it to us. They would sell it to us. And so you would buy a bag of ice and pretty much just keep trying to put ice on rags and put the rag on you to cool you off, rubbing ice on your body to try to cool you down because you would actually get heat exhausted if you didn't do so. Um, so yeah, just horrible. And just one final thing, I know you've spoken about it to me, Steph, that had a, a, a kind of psychological cost. On uh, uh, You said you got out and it was very hard for you to communicate, but I'll let you explain what that experience did to you. Yeah, so again, a lot of people, as I said, there was a lot of noise and guys would be screaming out of the cells. Um, 
I pride myself on being able to take any type of circumstances that are brought my way and take it as a challenge. And so I wouldn't yell out the cells. I wouldn't look for uh, human contact as far as someone to talk to. Instead, I would just read a book every day, right? Until I ran out of books to read. Um, but I got used to not having conversations with people. So I actually had to, once I, once I was released out of uh, S, um, ad seg, um, segregation, I had to pretty much relearn how to talk to people, so to say, um, and have conversations, you know, um, and it felt weird. Like people would be trying to talk to me. And um, one of my, my closest friends inside said to me one day, he said, you know, you have this five minute rule. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you'll give the people who matter to you about five minutes of your time. And then after that, you'll pretty much end the conversation. And I never realized that, you know, until and then all of a sudden I started paying attention. And he was right. You know, I stand there for a few minutes. And what I realized is the whole time I'm standing there for that five minutes, I really don't want to be standing there that long. And I don't feel like, like I didn't feel comfortable having conversations. So pretty much had to relearn how to, um, to converse with individuals, um, you know, humanize myself. And, and get back to that human contact. But, and that's just not me. A lot of people become that way. Um, I think some people haven't been blessed as I have been. Um, one of my close friends, um, Boris Franklin, who was inside with us as well, he actually told me one day, he said, listen, um, if you're gonna be successful out on the streets, you need to um, start talking to people. And so I actually just started practicing on individuals. You know, um, a social worker will walk by and I say, how you doing today? And that was my start. And I just kept building from there. And just two short things. You talked about the anger, the, the rage that you felt. And then I think you should, because it's in the book, tell the story about the news about your son that you okay. got while you were in, in, sol in solitary confinement. Yeah. So, I mean, um, yes, I mean, of course, there's a ton of anger. I mean, every, at every step that you go somewhere, you have to strip search, right? Um, so guards are telling you, you know, just to come down and take a shower, oftentimes, uh, they want you to walk down butt naked in front of everyone, you know, very degrading. If you're going to go to outside uh, to, to um, take advantage of being able to go outside to the yard, you have to strip butt naked. You have to uh, expose yourself for the guards and go through this ritual of, you know, putting your hands through your mouth. Um, but first, you're supposed to, you know, touch your, uh, your genitals and lift them up. But oftentimes guards will say after you put your hands in your mouth, hey, go back and lift your um, genitals up again and now go put them back, you know, go back to your mouth. And, um, you know, so I became extremely angry, you know, with um, authority figures and just individuals um, in general, even the people who are around me who were making all the noise, not understand, well, understanding that they were just trying to stay sane by yelling to one another, but they were disturbing my solitude um, that I was getting used to. And uh, the question, oh, as far as my son, so um, while in solitary, you know, some people would get the newspapers and we had a way in which we we get things we want from one another because the guards are not going to say, hey, you can go get that or that person can bring it to you. And they're surely not going to bring it to you. So we do what we call fishing, meaning we throw a line down the tier um, and we tie something to it. And then we pull it back to ourselves and get whatever we want at night once the guards are, you know, um, not really paying much attention and, la and more um, lackadaisical. And so I got the newspaper and I was sitting in my cell and I was reading and it was about maybe 11 o'clock at night and I'm reading the newspaper and, you know, I'm seeing this article about a man killed in North New Jersey. I'm like, okay, that's my city. And then I'm looking at the name and it's the same name as my son. And I'm looking at the age. I'm like, that's about his age, you know? And so I'm like, you know, saying all throughout the night, you know, I hope this isn't him. You know, a lot of people probably have that name. And uh, when I called home the next day, when I was able to, as soon as I was able to get the phone, you know, before I even got it out, I called my daughter and I said, hey, um, I read something and it said, and she was like, yeah, that was him, you know? And so again, no, uh, and I couldn't even go to the funeral, right? Well, not that I couldn't, but I would have to pay possibly about $800 in order to go to the viewing. Because if you want to go to a funeral to see someone, you have to pay to go. And so I chose not to go um, because that meant that I would be in debt, you know, and they would take every every time I got a check, whether I worked and made a few you know, pennies, they would take that. If someone sent me money to eat, they would take those funds as well. So, um, yeah, that was a hard thing to deal with. 
So I just wanted to move to the more optimistic part of your time inside, which was, I guess, discovering about this program. Um, you said to me that you were actually a nerd growing up, even though it wasn't a great environment. Your mom really was interested in you studying at school. And the reason why you got involved in crime was you were being bullied every day. And it was you learned to be a thug because it was a survival thing. It wasn't who you were. So in a way, you reclaimed the inner nerd by being in, in prison, correct? Yes. So tell me a little bit about how that felt to suddenly have the opportunity to be treated as Chris seems to call everybody that he worked with, an intellectual inside. I don't know if that is something he makes a conscious effort to do, but it must have been quite remarkable for someone to call you that. Yes, definitely. Um, and honestly, I had lost that belief in myself that I had early on um, as far as, you know, my academic prowess. I pretty much, um, the highest grade I completed and uh, on the streets was the eighth grade. So, um, you know, went from, like you said, being a nerd, finished my work within five minutes to getting bullied real bad and beat the crap out of him by 12, pretty much stopped going to school. And so honestly didn't see myself as this smart individual as far as when you talk academically because and honestly I grad I graduated elementary school I never you know I went to ninth grade a few days I never went any further I went to the streets um and as you said it was survival mode but when I got inside that was one of my trepidations um when the program came I was happy to have the opportunity I you know read every book I can get my hands on but to me honestly I thought that you know college must be super hard right because this is something that people in my community don't go to. So that must mean that it's difficult. And I was surprised, you know, when I would have conversations with professors and they would be like, wow, you know, amazing close read or you did excellent, you know, I had professors like Chris Hedges and uh, Cornell West, you know, uh, give you, you know, your flowers, so to say, and say, you know, this was amazing. Or I'm learning from you guys. And as you said, to actually call you an intellectual and see you as such. Um, yeah, it did a, to me, that was the most amazing thing about the college experience, not the things that I read and learned, although they have been extremely helpful, but to have individuals as such build up, build my confidence and build others' confidence, you know, because um, we have been broken in a lot of ways. Uh, and so, you know, I come from a, a community where you're taught that you don't belong in certain spaces. Uh, France Fanon says in his book, the first thing that the native learns is to stay in his place and not go beyond certain limits. And he, although he's talking about the colonized, that, that quote, you know, is relative to our situation. You know, um, we believe oftentimes, I know myself that I didn't belong in college. I wasn't fit for it. Instead, I was fit for the streets criminality or working manual labor. And so to have people actually say, no, you're an intellectual, absolutely and see you as such, I mean, that just changed, you know, the way I even thought it gave me a sense of old belonging, that I belonged in a different space and that, you know, what I've been taught and or forced to believe was wrong. So, but uh, apart from the self-esteem issue, it also gave you tools to yes. come out with, which yes. is extremely rare. I don't know, Chris, what the statistics are, but this must be a very small program in terms of the national population, which is now over 2 million incarcerated people in this country, right? We topped the global scale um, and number of people incarcerated. So did you not feel, Chris, even though you, you say you're cynical, but <laughs> you must be optimistic to go in and teach, save these souls one by one, really. Um, is it not just a drop in the ocean? How do we get this Yeah, I wouldn't use the word cynical about me. I think cynics, you know, don't do anything. Um, I, I have a, you know, I was a newspaper reporter for a long time. I have a pretty good understanding of the systems of power and how they work and how they perpetuate themselves. And, uh, so none of that was a mystery. Uh, and as a war correspondent, that was my primary job. Uh, I fought against murderous forms of power without any illusion, uh, that anything I wrote often at great risk was the next day going to bring, uh, you know, about uh, any kind of radical change. 
so whether I was in El Salvador or whether I was in Bosnia, the, the, the way photographers and reporters work is that there's usually reports of a large number of killings in a village. Um, in uh, the Serbs were quite active in terms of shooting reporters and photographers. 45 uh, foreign reporters were killed before I even got to Sarajevo. That happened in Salvador. 22 reporters were killed in Salvador, but the Serbs really targeted us. So they would cut off all access to a village. We would put satellite phones into our backpacks and walk in, and they would have snipers that would fire on us. Uh, so it was incredibly dangerous to document the atrocities, and yet that was a kind of victory so that uh, th they couldn't say it didn't happen. Uh, and that was also true in El Salvador. <clears throat> I spent a lot of time in Gaza uh, fighting against the Israelis who lie through their teeth. Uh, and, uh, and so um, I think because I kept so close to the ground, I understood that maybe every victory is Pyrrhic, but it's still a victory. Um, and, uh, and, and so I look at mass incarceration. I just want to say in terms of the college program, it was, first of all, it was brought in, it was organized by the students, Tone, uh, Russ, I don't know if you were involved, Steph, and others. Um, these were, you know, intellectuals. These were people like Steph who had turned their cells into libraries. Uh, so they already had a very high intellectual level uh, before any of us got in there. Uh, and they were the ones who brought the college program in, uh, working with these great figures, uh, Don Roden, who's, I think Steph would agree, uh, Professor Rutgers, we all think is as, about as close to sainthood as you can get, uh, along with Chris Agins, who runs the program now, uh, Margaret Atkins. I mean, they really dedicated wonderful Toby, uh, Sanders, and others. Um, uh, so, th you know, we were dealing with a, a very select group within the prison uh, and uh, and and so our college program met you know their intellectual needs and their intellectual capabilities we also need huge vocational programs and my uncle was a plumber I don't look down in any way on uh, you know and Steph's an intellectual Boris Franklin Russ Owen I mean these people are really serious 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 thinkers and students and scholars he's got two degrees up there and you really can't read it it says summa cum laude uh, out of Rutgers and imagine graduating from any college especially one as good as Rutgers summa cum laude while you're in a prison uh, I mean that's pretty remarkable uh, so um, you know I, 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 I would say what fuels me is anger not hate anger uh, Augustine says that hope has two beautiful daughters anger and courage anger at the way things are and courage to see that they don't remain the way they are. Uh, and yet I'm very, have a very, and I think all of the students in the class like Steph as well, we have a very hard-nosed understanding of power. They, they have been victims of neoliberalism, victims of a, of a dysfunctional judiciary, victims of poverty, victims of police violence. I, you know, all of the interlocking mechanisms of institutional racism that keep the poor poor. They know how those systems work better than you or I. Um, and, and that's what's so heroic, is to stand up and assert your own dignity, uh, to refuse to allow these oppressive systems to define you and tell you who you are. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean, and uh, you know, I quote Solzhenitsyn in the book, I like the Gulag Archipelago, he talks about a actually he's a Serb, they're both in exile together, and, uh, you know, just to fight back, uh, it is a victory because in and of itself, it is a testament to your own strength and your own integrity, even if the system remains intact. Uh, and that's why I admire people like Steph so much. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think I could have gone through what he's gone through and become the person he's become. So we have two great questions have come in. Um, Urs says, why are US prisons focused on dehumanizing punishment rather than rehab and reintroduction into society as a useful member of society? Which of course is- Well, I, I, Steph can answer that better than I, but let me give my quick answer. Uh, prisons are designed uh, as a primary form of social control with deindustrialization, the rupturing of what the sociologist Emil Durk Durkheim calls social bonds. Those are destroyed, so you're not integrated or knit to the society. 
Uh, and so your primary forms of social control outside prison become militarized police that function as internal armies of occupation that indiscriminately use lethal force and terror and mass incarceration. Uh, and if you look at any colonial project, because that's really what this is, it's a replication of corporate colonialism, those are the mechanisms, that's those are the mechanisms Israel uses against the Palestinians. Gaza is the largest open air prison on earth. Uh, so uh, the, the, the whole point is to be punitive. It's not to, they don't want you to go back in the society. I mean, you know, a, a body on the streets of Newark or Camden doesn't generate any money. It's what, for the corporate forces that dominate the country, what Marx calls surplus labor. But if you lock them in a cage, they can generate fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year. And just before I let Steph also examine this, that we have to remember, we talk about privatized prisons. All prisons, state, federal, they're all privatized uh, because all of the services, the commissary, the medical, the phone service, Global Tel Link, Armark, the fo food service, and there's constant cases of uh, massive food poisoning because of the rancid food they serve to people incarcerated. Uh, the the everything is it's it's a multi billion dollar a year industry, and their lobbyists are the ones who maintain our recidivism rate, which is seventy six percent within five years. So uh, the system works just the way the architects of the system have set it up. But I'll let Steph talk about this. Yeah, um, my answer is not very much different than yours, Chris. I guess it's just personal experience. I will also say that the system works how it's supposed to work and it's designed to work. And the system, system actually starts before incarceration. So in the communities that I grew up in, the black and brown poor communities, uh, they're carceral spaces. You know, um, the prison doesn't look much different than the elementary school and the high schools that I went to. There's bars on the windows, locks on the doors, you know, metal detectors you have to go through. Um, even on your way to school, oftentimes you might have a police officer or two who might stop you and harass you. Um, these things are sent are, are pretty much in place to also uh, dehumanize you and anger you. So by the time you get to prison after going through all these things on the street, you're already angry. You're already fed up with the system. And then when you get inside and you realize that the system that they say they're supposed to be re rehabilitating you, they do nothing for you. And so now you're even angry and most people might come out either broken and or uh, angry you know, and, and rebellious, even more so. So um, you talk about it being privatized and it being about money. Myself alone, I did 20 years and four months in prison at $55,000 a year in the state of New Jersey. That's $1.1 million that was made off of me. Wow. And it's made, uh, you know, through my incarceration. And I'm just one person that was incarcerated in New Jersey. And so that's taxpayers' money. You know, so the system is designed. Why would they want to rehabilitate if it's to make money? That means that officers are going to, they're not going to be able to uh, continue to pay the salaries of many officers. Judges may lose their jobs. Uh, prosecutors, if there's not a bunch of people coming through the system, police officers. And so the system works exactly as it's supposed to work. And that's not counting the $1.1 million that the taxpayers uh, funnel through the system to keep me incarcerated. It doesn't even count the tens of thousands of dollars that myself and others like me had to pay through my incarceration for things like food and cosmetics, uh, having conversations with my family members and the likes. So the system works. Uh, Vincent has said, I myself have been incarcerated and will be finishing my bachelor's degree in communications next winter. What can we do to make people more informed of not only what goes on in prison, and change their minds, perspectives about the people that are released after an educational opportunity. I'll let Steph handle that. I mean, I wrote the book to really shatter the demonization of these remarkable men, and I've taught in the women's prison too, women uh, who are, I mean, I, when I wrote a, I wrote a uh, Steph knows him, I wrote a letter for Russ Owen, remarkable guy, uh, got out after 32 years. I said, look, this is one of the most remarkable people I've met in or outside prison. I meant it. I, I would say the same thing about Steph. Uh, and yet, you know, what's frustrating is that within mass media and within the wider culture, uh, prisoners are those we are all permitted to demonize and hate. Uh, and I can't stand these TV shows. I don't have a TV, so I don't see them too much. 
uh, but I hear a lot about them. My experience in prison is sitting around with people like Steph for two hours talking about James Baldwin. Uh, but that will make great TV. Uh, it makes great TV when guards are beating back animals. Uh, so that kind of stereotype uh, has just been so embedded. Uh, and that's, of course, intentional. Because when you dehumanize people, when you objectify people, uh, and then we've got racism on top of it, because disproportionately people of color are in our prison system, uh, it allows people to exist off of false stereotypes. And if there was really one motive to write this book, it was that. It was to humanize my students and expose that lie. Uh, but I'll let Steph talk about that. Yeah, so I think for the individual who was formerly incarcerated, uh, I think back to when I first, and I was still incarcerated, I was in a halfway house going to Rutgers University in the day and coming back to incarceration at night. But while at Rutgers, um, you know, I was going to class and I was very open about my incarceration. I was a criminal justice major and they were talking about a subject that I knew more of than a lot of professors, right? And so I would chime in and the great thing that I loved about it was my professors at Rutgers Camden, they invited that and they, you know, they actually said that to me, like, we need your voice. But I had other, uh, another classmate who was inside with me and he had been released but he wouldn't say anything about his incarceration. And right then at that moment, me and him had a conversation one day as to why he wasn't uh, willing to speak out and say that he was incarcerated like I was. I told him and I tell everybody, you know, and I, this is what I live by is that I refuse to be incarcerated by my incarceration. And so, you know, I'm quick to say to individuals, hey, by the way, I'm formally incarcerated because if you speak to me first, without knowing. So, you know, individual may say, wow, you're, you're intelligent or, you know, you can articulate yourself very well in which they don't say to white people, oftentimes we say to black men, right? But that's another subject. However, uh, what I would say, yeah, and I'm also formerly incarcerated, right? And they'd be like, wow, I would have never thought so. And, and why? Because your perception of individuals who are incarcerated is what, right? And so now we can have a conversation. Um, but also when I, carry myself and manners and anything I do in life now, I bring my brothers that are still incarcerated with me and those who have come out. And so if I carry myself in a way and I have now humanized myself in the eyes of many, then hopefully I can humanize those who are still left behind. I could change the narrative of what it is to be incarcerated, to be criminal, right? Because, you know, many people say, oh, he's criminal, especially if you're black and criminal, then you're, 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 you're not human. Even the 13th Amendment says that once you're incarcerated or convicted of a crime, you're a slave, you're no longer human, right? So um, that's what my answer will be. Um, own it, own your incarceration or your, your, you know, your, your past incarceration, but do so in a way in which people have to look back and say, wow, it must be something wrong with the system because this is an amazing human being and not just a you know, formerly incarcerated or criminal type person. So it's quite a lot of your work, Stefan, going back to where you're from as a kind of ambassador. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, who better, who better to try to change things than those who have been affected, those who have been uh, forgotten about, those who have been taken advantage of? Who, who knows the system like we know it? Right. So absolutely. That, that's my calling. So we've got some more questions here. Um, Time's ticking away. Um, Sharon says, I'd like to know what Stefan thinks of the Black Lives Matter movement in the context of his lived experience. So um, I think it's, it's great in the sense that people are talking about things now and things are coming out, especially with uh, camera phones on cell phones now. Um, but this stuff has been going on. You know, um, Black Lives should have been matter. And so it's just now people are coming together and trying to do something, standing up. Um, so I think in the one sense that we need that more people need to do something. Um, I think it's horrible that we have to actually say that black lives matter. Right. Like, um, like it's that's that's just uh, insane. We're in 2021 and we actually actually have to say that we matter. So um, I think it's just about um, how do we make it to a point where we no longer have to say that Black Lives Matter. That, that's, that's the day that I'm looking for. Mm. 
Um, Lynn has said, I volunteer for a prison book program for filling requests for books. There are always attempts by st some states to shut the programs down. How can these programs be integrated with educational programs to streamline efforts to help people acquire skills and education to integrate back into the community? Any ideas? So I, I with Labyrinth Books, which donated the books, there was, when I got there, there was no research library for them. But, you know, it's, it's always, you're dealing with an irrational system uh, that just arbitrarily makes decisions uh, because they can. I mean, it's a totalitarian system. Prisons are the modern iteration of plantations, uh, just on a whim. So it's, it, it's really difficult. Uh, and in, in this case, I guess uh, hopefully they won't be watching, uh, I would bring in, I would, you know, put on a little tie and a button down shirt and go to the mail room, which was behind the prison with a few boxes of books at a time. And then the, it would go, uh, well, where's the letter? Do you have, oh, I said, oh, you mean you didn't get a letter? I won't say the name of the prison administrator. Well, they, but I know that prison is kind of dysfunctional. And I, you know, I looked relatively harmless. So uh, I think it was, was that during, uh, the, that class stuff that I brought all those books in? Yeah. So every week I was bringing, <laughs> <laughs> until I got to 700 books, uh, but it was all under the radar, and that built them a library. Uh, but it's a it's a serious issue, and uh, we you have to remember that prisons are not. Uh, I think it's counterproductive because in the case of East Jersey State, you have 140 people in the college program, and so many people who want to get in, but you can't get in if you have charges, if your disciplinary record isn't good. So it actually helps keep the prison in the eyes of the administrators. Uh, quiet, under control. Uh, but there's a lot of hostility because the corrections officers don't have college degrees. Uh, and, and then there's, you know, some, there's a, there was a guy who was at the, uh, Jesus, uh, what was his last name? Anyway, the guy used to sit on the corridor. He was great. I mean, he was respectful. He was nice. But then you also get corrections officers, especially if they've done a couple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, who come in pumped up. I mean, it's just, a, it's a really, you know, the system itself is not open. It's not, it's not, there, there's a lot of uh, resistance within the system to this program, to getting in things like that. It's a constant battle. I don't, I don't get headaches, but I used to finish those book deliveries and it immediately start popping Tylenol. I'll let staff talk about that. Yeah, so the, the question is what can be done about it? Mm. So um, there's a lot there's a movement right now as far as education in prison. Last week, I just spent the last four days at the National Conference of Higher Education in Prison. And so at that, uh, at that conference, I believe it was supposed to be 500 people that showed up, all doing the work for uh, education inside of prison. So there's a ton of uh, different uh, organizations that are doing the work and um, I would say to try to team up with some of those um, those uh, organizations or inst different institutions. Um, but I mean, even if you were to donate, right? People can actually get books sent in. Sometimes, um, if you learn how to maybe go through, like like Chris say, if it's a different uh, company that you can actually. Uh, order books from because one thing they want to make sure that you order it so that they can get it coming in. But if you ask me, they just want to make sure that revenue is going somewhere for anything that you get. But what it would it look like if someone set up a bookstore, work with a bookstore that says, hey, for every book that you order, we'll donate you two more books, right? So there's ways you just have to think creatively and figure out how can we be the system that is designed to, you know, hold people from an education and from books. Um, we actually are listing uh, for people. Uh, Reggie Dwayne Betts started a very good program called uh, Freedom Reads. Uh, so people might want to look that up. We've posted, um, we're going to post the link to it. Um, and that is a very good way to get books. Uh, he's trying to get libraries into juvenile detention centers as well as prisons. Um, we've got a question here from Derek. May you explain the difference between Plato's cave and the transformation in prison? Is that that's a good question, actually, and I'll let Steph talk about it. But but I think that's a good question because I just speak as a teacher. Uh, 
that is my goal, is to shatter the illusions uh, by which even the victims of those illusions will speak about their lives. That is really my fundamental goal, but that's the fundamental goal of an education. It's to give people an understanding and a language of a reality. Uh, and as Antonio Gramsci understood, culture is a weapon in the hands of the elite. And the way that that weapon is used is that it denies you your history, your story, since in essence attempts to erase your story. We read uh, Joe Turner Come and Gone, the great play by August Wilson, and it's about uh, uh, you know slavery by another name, convict leasing, and he, he's enslaved for seven years as a convict, uh, comes north looking for his wife, uh, and there's a conjurer in the play who keeps saying you have to find your song. And when we wrote the play, I really looked at that as their song. Um, but it is about shattering, and as I told my students, the problem, and I, I think Steph and I have spoken about this, is that when you see it, when you understand it, when you know how power works, when the lies that the wider culture feeds you through mass media are exposed, that inevitably makes you lonely. Um, intellectuals are lonely, um, but I'll let Steph talk about that. Yeah. Um... For me, I think at first it depends on uh, one's perception of what uh, Plato was, um, what the cave actually represented. Um, you know, some people believe that it was uh, highlighting that individuals who are incarcerated are basically stuck in time and have no autonomy, can't do anything, and they're just, you know, stuck. They're like in chains, right? However, you know, one thing I've learned, like, Chris would tell you, we, we, we had libraries, we had our own libraries, you know, hundreds of books in ourselves. I watched guys um, have so many books in their room that they had half of their bed where it was books and the other half, they slept sideways because there wasn't enough room to, to lay flat, right? Um, but you can lock the body, but you can't trap the mind. That's the way that I came into the prison system. And that was my mind state that they can have my body, but my mind, they'll never get it. And so, you know, um, to think about Plato and to think about that cave is that individuals in prison, you know, can can be can achieve uh, mental, you know. We have we have an opportunity while inside to do what most people can't. Right. Because we have a, not that we have a little extra time. on hands. Don't be don't get me wrong. Most of us work and have to work the bus out. But, you know, um, and if you don't you know, oftentimes you get charges and you can go to solitary confinement for that if you don't work for almost nothing, you know, 10 cents an hour or something like that. But we we have been enlightened in the sense that we need to actually try to figure out what this system is, learn more about ourselves, our history. And so individuals in, in, in prison, not everyone, but those who have made a decision to come out a better person, uh, in a lot of ways to me, there's similitudes, but there's the opposite of what some people think about that cave and what that cave represents. For me, that uh, the cave or prison represented a chance for me to get myself together and come out a better person. Um, we've posted the talk with Reggie Betts for people and also the link to his uh, Freedom Reads for anyone who's interested. Um, We've only got a few minutes left. Um, how important, Chris, do you think books are in improving the mental health of prisoners and having a calming effect on violence? Um, they've had lots of studies showing that when you have prisoners in a choir, for example, they're much calmer. There's less incidents of violence. Yeah, I they're think, doing... let's ask Steph that. I mean, I think he's, hmm. he probably can answer that better than I can. I would say it depends on what kind of books you're reading, <laughs> you know, because honestly, like some people can read hood novels, right? What we call them. And, you know, with sensualized, um, sensationalized violence and want to, you know, want to do more violence. Um, even sometimes, like if you might read some of the American history books that there was a lot of violence in place, right? Might mean it makes right. And so you might read some of those things and feel like, hey, you know, and sometimes you can be angry because you don't know how to channel some of those things you're reading. But the difference for me uh, with having professors come in intentional about not just giving us books to read, but giving us books that would teach us about what justice looks like, what injustice looks like, 
what's wrong with this country, right? What's wrong with these systems that's in place? Um, so more than just books, but how do you make sure people are, are reading the right books, you know, being very pointed about what people are taking in and then having given them a chance to have a conversation and, and you know, uh, bounce some of those things off of others who may be uh, intellectuals as well and gets, you know, sometimes, you know, the confidence like, oh, wow, OK, so what I said made sense. So um, it's, it's not just books. Books are important, but also giving people a chance to talk to individuals about those books who actually can help them, you know, get more of an understanding. And I think, you know, for those of us who come out of a formal education, that's what we can. Uh, were you in the class where we read uh, Politics and Vision by Sheldon Wolin? I don't know yeah, if you were given that. You made us write 20-page papers on that, in that class, absolutely. <laughs> That's a graduate-level book. I mean, it's a brilliant work. And uh, I, I wasn't going to tell them what Nietzsche thought. I sat there and said, you're going to tell me. And that if remember, that class was only supposed to be 12. I think we ended up teaching like 36 classes because I would sit there and I go, I'm not telling you what Marx says. You have to tell me. That's also the class we're talking about prison scholars. We had a student named Hanif. I did my talk on Marx, and then I heard this sigh at the back of the room. He goes, oh, we waited all semester for Marx, and it's over. I said, all right, Hanif, I'll, I'll when we finish the book, and boy, what was that, about 800-page book or something? Uh, I said, when I finish the book, I'll come back and give you another two hours on Marx, which I did. So I think that, you know, I did my graduate work at Harvard. I have a very formal education. So th that, I think, is a gift that the professors can bring. Is they, as Steph said, it's we can bring a book like Politics and Vision, which uh, is just uh, magisterial. I mean, it's just a remarkable. And Sheldon Wolin is probably died a few years ago, our most important contemporary political philosopher, that they wouldn't necessarily have heard of or knew about. Um, we're going to end on a quote here before, unless you want to end on something else, at least say this because it was very empowering. Um, it's from a guy who's on the advisory board of Freedom Reads, James McBride. He said, reading is the last line of defense between the wild west and you. When you open a book, you're putting up a barrier between what the world thinks of you and who you really are. I can't emphasize it enough. If you read, you're moving on the path toward true freedom. It doesn't matter where you are. So I think, Stefan, you're a, an embodiment of that uh, quote today of the power of the word <laughs> taught by the right person in the hands of the right mentor, I'd say, <laughs> is very helpful. <laughs> So um, what parting words? We've only got a couple of minutes, uh, either of you, on this uh, going forward. I mean, I just want to say, uh, you know, uh, and, and that's why I wrote the book, that these are men and I'm not and the women as well. And the women have it harder in many ways than the men because they're uh, they don't have the support systems usually are people of profound integrity, profound brilliance. Uh, had have so much to contribute, and it's not just their families or their communities that are impoverished by their incarceration, but all of us uh, as a society, and I'll let Steph close us out. Yeah, I was just, I mean, there's so much to say and think, but I guess one thing that just comes to mind is not only do Black lives matter, but incarcerated lives matter as well. Well, um... I think that's been a, a just a tip of the iceberg of looking into this, but it, I, I encourage everybody to read Chris's book. It's 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 just remarkable because the detail of these people's lives is better than anything you could invent. Like very good uh, nonfiction is, uh, the facts are, are incredible. Um, and I, I think College Behind Bars was another great documentary I watched PBS made, um, which followed a group of prisoners trying to get educated and how hard it was for them. Um, okay, so I'm gonna thank Chris Hedges and Stefan Whitley for joining us with this very important discussion today. Kudos to you both. Chris, for your great tireless work and you Stefan for making it through despite all the odds. <laughs>